Then God would say, just love him. Just love him. Just be kind. Make him some cookies. Take him some to work. Have him over for a good meal. Things like that, of just sowing love. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. You know, John, here at Focus on the Family, we love stories of hope. I mean, that's what it's all about, redemption. And uh, the Christian life is that story uh, where people are struggling. They don't know their purpose. They don't know what's happening, why things are going wrong. They encounter Christ through a friend, through a church, through whatever means, and their life begins to make more sense. And they begin, hopefully, to change. And that's the key, that sanctification process. Uh, Romans 5 tells us, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Man, I love that. I mean, that is power packed. And it sums up the story we're going to hear today. Yeah, Ron and Opal Erickson have walked through the fires of uh, that kind of suffering you described. There's been uh, moments of failed marriage, rejection, adultery, but God has done a remarkable work, and we are so pleased to share that with our listeners today. Ron is an accomplished steel guitarist, and Opal sings as they minister to seniors across the country, and they've been singing together for over 40 years. Uh, now, they happen to be a host couple for our Hope Restored Marriage Intensives, and that, of course, Jim, is for couples on the brink of separation or divorce. Yeah, I'm so excited about that program, and you get to see it right up close. We uh, do. Yeah. And we so appreciate that. But couples who are on the brink of divorce, many of them, and this is their last hope. Mm. And uh, we have an 81% post-two-year success rate. We just re-verified uh, that statistic, and I'm pleased with that. Um, that is a great success rate. I want to say to Ron and Opal, welcome to Focus on the Family. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you do work with Hope Restored. Uh, what kinds of things do people say, do couples say when they come to the program? What brings them there? Fear, frustration, anxiety. They, do, they have an intensive program, five days, as you know, and I look at it as couples that are in intensive care mm -hmm. for survival for their marriage. They, this is the last hope for many of them. Yeah. Now you've been there. I mean, that's what makes your story so compelling. It's almost your pain became your passion. Absolutely. And that's, I'm that's sure, right. why you're involved with exactly. Hope Restored. Um, let's start from the beginning. How did you two meet? I was in the Air Force at the time, and I was stationed at Warner Robins, Georgia, which was about 15 miles from Macon. And I was playing banjo at Shakey's Pizza, <laughs> ragtime Dixieland music, um, four nights a week. And she came in there as a, as a patron with another airman friend of mine as a date. And I, I saw her walk in the door, and I made an attempt to meet her. And That was a bold I, move, by the way. It, it was. <laughs> <laughs> but and now, um, what, what were you thinking when this brave well, young... I was frustrated, very frustrated that I had this date with this guy. Um, he, I had befriended him and had uh, helped him out in a tough situation when he was moneyless. And um, so he wanted to just do something kind for me. And he wanted to take me to meet his friends that played at Shakey's. <laughs> and so I was so aggravated all day at work. I just kept saying, why did I agree to this? This is ridiculous. And so <laughs> Anyway, I called a friend of mine from church and I said, would you and your brother go with us to Shakey's tonight? <laughs> because <laughs> I just... Um, need some help here. Mm -hmm. And so she was some my cover. Yeah, she was my age. He was this guy's age, a young airman. And so anyway, we did that and uh, when I saw Ron, I was kind of mm -hmm, I like that and I like a musician and I like a guy that can sing. So anyway, <laughs> it went pretty good. From a faith perspective, where were you coming from? Were you Christians when you met and was the Lord the central part of your relationship? Mm -hmm. I came to know Christ at a very young age. I mean, I don't even remember my age, actually, but like probably six or seven, something like that. So he was a very integral part of my life, always, mm. just my my friend. And um, my mother was a wonderful Christian, and so she was my example. My dad was not a believer at that time and didn't come to know the Lord until late, later in life. And I was raised in a Christian family. Uh, 
in a, in a Christian church, but it was the kind of church that never offered an opportunity to make a decision. It was New Year's Eve, 1971. After playing at Shakey's that night, I went home by myself as a, as a single airman, and I turned the TV on, and I was watching a, a program, and, and one of the Grand Ole Opry stars, Connie Smith, was performing, and I thought this was a country music special. It turned out to be a Rex Humbard ministry show, okay. and uh, she shared her testimony, and, I, and it was that evening that I committed myself to Christ wow. you know, for, for salvation. And, and I also prayed that evening that God would send me a godly wife. Yeah because I, I was tired of being alone and being single, and I wanted the right woman. Yeah, and that's everybody's desire. Right. You know, I, I'm thoughtful of that, because you look at television ministry, look at radio ministry. You know, so many people even write focus about um, getting to know Christ through the program mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. making a commitment to Christ through their program. It's a wonderful and very re rewarding feeling that we all get to participate in something like that. and. We don't know their stories. They may not be public figures, right. but uh, the Lord knows. And mm -hmm. if you're in that spot, my goodness, that's job one for us is to make sure we introduce you to Christ. Mm -hmm. um, take us through that early part of marriage. First 19 years, you're sailing along, it sounds like. Uh, were there difficulties? Were you experiencing kind of that flesh, you know, the anger and other things that some marriages face? I found out early on that neither one of us were quite what we expected because we got married within... Uh, 90 days of meeting. Hmm. And I think that's probably true with most couples. We really don't know each other until we're married. You might court three or four years and not know each that's other right. really well, yeah, too. Yeah. So, But that was one of, the, one of the cracks in your relationship, it sounds like. Well, it was, and I, I thought that perhaps she has a commercial voice, and she's an excellent singer and performer. And I always had dreams and aspirations of being a musician and, and full-time entertainment. And when opportunities would come along in our life for that to happen, she declined. And that hurt me, and it, it hurt my expectations and aspirations for a career with both of us. But I found out you know, later in life that was not God's plan. That was huh. my plan. Right. And that caused bitterness and resentment to, to come into my life because there were unmet expectations not only in that arena, but in, in other areas of life, as we all have. But I didn't feel comfortable confronting those. Because yeah. I thought, well, I'm just wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, and I can't force my, my um, aspirations on her. Yeah. Opal, how are you feeling about that? You're feeling well, a bit of tension there and disappointment? At times, yes. Um, actually, the opportunities that came our way, you know, one probably would have taken us to Nashville. That was... Um, uh, with us being kind of a country, southern gospel background. But um, I just I just couldn't do that because I could not see myself playing in bars. That just was not appealing to me whatsoever. Right. And so so that was a turn down. And then there was a couple of other opportunities that um, I just wasn't ready to take a baby on the road for something like, you know, to be traveling all the time. And and so you're so, the prudent one, the wise one, saying well, this isn't really the future for and us. And I just didn't feel like that was what the Lord wanted in sure. our, our marriage, our life at that time. So the years go by, and you're doing marriage, you're doing parenting, you're making a living. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, you sought out counseling. What, what prompted that? What situation were you in? What was the environment like? Mm -hmm. Well, we had, we had lived... Uh, our life serving God and we raised our two daughters in the church and we we're active with the youth groups and and I played music in the church and we sang with the praise and worship team we did all the right things and it, we were very sincere about it but still there was an underlying tension that hadn't been addressed and we went um, to counseling with actually with Gary Smalley after I moved out of the house. This was in 1998. Right. And I had moved out and I'd, I got involved with an employee of ours. And, uh, you know, it seemed on the surface that she understood me and could meet my needs and, and I was able to be a father figure or, a, or a, a mentor to her and help her. So it was crazy, but it's all a life of deception. Hmm. And 
we went to visit with Gary Smalley, and the first visit that we had with him, I had to stop seeing the other person, of course. That was what he said. Right, and yeah. I, did, I wasn't willing to do that. I, I didn't want to go back to where I was in the relationship with my wife. Mm -hmm. I wanted out of it. I wanted to seek a divorce, but I knew that I had no spiritual grounds for it. She had done nothing that would allow me to seek a divorce that God would approve of. Ron, let me ask you this. I mean, honestly, now you're past that this many years ago, and Opal, we're going to get to you and get your perspective on this um, because women right now are screaming at the radio. Right. <laughs> Why did you stay with him? Mm -hmm. Hang on, everybody, mm -hmm. because uh, God's heart is big enough to absorb our sins. Mm -hmm. uh, but, Ron, I really I do want to ask you, uh, was it selfishness? Was it pride? When you look back at the sins that we commit in our own flesh that works against God's best for us, now that you have retrospective, what do you think was working in your heart? Why the deception? Why the fog? Is it wrapped in pride or selfishness? It was about me. I wanted my needs met. I wanted myself to be happy. Um, again, you're speaking to some spouse that is going, that's my husband, that's my wife, or that's me. That's right. I, th I think pride has a lot to do with it. And having your own needs met it, it's a greed kind of thing. I wasn't too concerned about meeting her needs. Yeah. I didn't feel like she had any. I thought I met all of the needs in her life, but she wasn't meeting mine. And it was more than just the career opportunities, but, but that can be anything in anybody's life. Right. The, it's that those, me monster thing. It is. Yeah, Opal, um, tell us what you're feeling, what you're going through. And these things are not instantaneous. These situations often take months, years to develop. Mm -hmm. So it's not probably a surprise right. to you what Ron was going through, but describe where you were at. Well, things had gone quite well for us until right about, I think Ron, we had turned 30, about 35, 36 years old, and uh, he went through a midlife crisis at that point. And um, so that was the beginning of a, a troublesome time in 1997, when this really kind of blew up again, started, it was just, it was a replay of that midlife crisis thing. And so he just kind of lost his way and he just was, he was just an unhappy person. Mm -hmm. But early on, uh, I mean, I, I knew that things were troubled and I was just seeking God, what's wrong? He, he t shut down at this point. He wouldn't really communicate with me at all. And so I just really, spent time with the, with the Lord, praying, fasting, and seeking Him and His will and, and revelation of what's going on here. And so anyway, God did reveal to me the affair, and um, that was a shocker. And then, like Ron said, He had moved out. And I, I just, um, it's like, Lord, you just, you know, you've got to help me with this because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what to do. I was scared to death and hated what was happening. Mm. But early in that first month, within that first month that he moved out, God spoke so plainly to my heart and said, stand and believe for your marriage. Hmm. Stand and believe. Stand and believe. Good words. And in, in the dis discovery mode of what was happening with him, the Lord had me go to Hosea hmm. and to the prodigal story and to really read that again. And, and to I, walk it. And to walk it. And it was, okay, Lord, all I'm hearing right now is love him, mm -hmm. but let him go. And I was like, what does that really mean, Lord? Mm -hmm. Well, then a few months later, the let go happened because he left, moved out. Yeah. And though he had moved out, we still owned our own business together, so we worked together every day. Oh, my goodness. So it was like he left me every evening yeah, yeah, again. Yeah. That but God hard. said to stand, and he's, the scripture he gave me was Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. It says, cast not away thy confidence, for it has great reward, for you have need of endurance. But after you have done the will of God, you shall receive the promise. Uh, and uh, that was a word to my heart. Uh, Opal, I, I need to ask you, though, to help the person who's listening, again, mm -hmm. uh, the husband or the wife, that maybe they're... Uh, spouse has been unfaithful, whatever it might have been. Mm -hmm. When you say Hebrews 10 there, and you're mm -hmm. giving us that scripture, when you've done everything 
that God has asked you to do, in essence. Mm -hmm. Describe what that is, because how did you, A, know what it was that God wanted you to do, and then B, how did you do that with a heart of kindness when it's easy for our flesh to rear up and say, I have every right to walk out of this. Even God mm -hmm. gives me the right to That's walk right. out of this right now. That's right. His heart is not for that. Mm -hmm. But he said, in this kind of situation, this is the one instance where I can leave you. Yep. And God will support me in that. Mm -hmm. How did you fight that temptation? How did you know what was the right will of God to do? Well, I had seen what divorce had done in my siblings and so in my family. And my heart was, I didn't ever want to go down that path because I believe God's word says that God hates divorce. This is what I love about that. He doesn't hate divorced people, but he hates what divorce does to people. Why is that, do you think, from a spiritual standpoint? I, I think it's because it separates the divine nature of God in us as male and female and marriage as the model of what God intended for us to be complete. Absolutely. And so it, it shatters that. It does. And it grieves his heart. And it has such a ripple effect, yeah, like an earthquake. And it just goes on through generations and to, you know, to family, to friends, and it affects so many people. So my heart was to just stay true to God and, and just trust him with the word that he had given me. It, um, I have to tell you, it was not easy. And I could not. In fact, I, my brother-in-law said to me later after we'd gotten back together, he said, Opal, I could have never done what you did. And I said, you know what? I could have never done what I did, mm. except through the grace of God. Huh. But there would be days when I wanted to go bash out his windshields and slit his tires and, I mean, you know, really flesh was there. And those were the easy thoughts. <clears throat> yes, they were. <laughs> but then God would say, just love him. Just love him. Just be kind. Bake him some cookies. Take him some to work. Have him over for a good meal. Things like that of just sowing love. That's where I learned a new lesson about what God's love really is. Mm. It isn't just loving your neighbor. I thought I could do that pretty good, but I had to learn to really love my husband in a new way. Mm -hmm. I mean, With it's, no expectations. That's what it means. Yeah. Yeah. Not expecting anything because I was getting nothing. By all human signs, your prayers were not being answered as Ron pursued right. divorce, right? That's right? It was 18 months. Yes. Mm. A year and a half. patience, apart. and you're trying to get away. <clears throat> yeah. So what was that moment? When, Ron, did you say, okay, I'm hearing God's voice in my own heart? I mean, Opal's her hearing the Lord in her heart. I mean, baking cookies for you was no easy matter. And so what started that process for you to say, I am the man? Can I I'm just say that I, I think I want to interrupt there just a little bit because I think it's what God did in me that generated what happened with him. Mm. That's often how it is. It is. Yes, because, um, you know, I was hearing all these voices that you mentioned before, you know, get rid of the bum, just, just get rid of him and go on with your life and, you know, it's okay with God and just do that. But that wasn't what my heart was. And so I um, didn't listen to those voices, but after 13 months, Ron filed for divorce and he started going downhill even worse from there. I saw him literally destroying himself, just almost like dying before my eyes. And so I just was in prayer again, Lord, what do I do? And he spoke this word into my heart, exile. And I said, Lord, what are you really saying to me through that? So I went to the dictionary and I looked it up and it says, removing one's self from their own homeland or country by force or by their own will. And I said, Lord, are you telling me that it's time for me to leave here, to get out of Dodge, mm. get out of Branson? And I said, if so, I need to know. I need to have a real strong confirmation. That night on TV, there was an evangelist preaching, never had heard before, and he spoke on exile. Oh. I had never heard a message before or since on exile. And I said, okay, God, I get it. So we were in the process of selling a home. We got that taken care of. And I left and moved, went, didn't move, but we closed on the house and all that. And I 
left Ron, and I told him, I said, um, left work, you know, walked away from the job. And I said, I have to go and get well. I said, I am a mental and physical, emotional wreck. And I said, I don't want to hear from you outside of a death in the family because I needed to just get that out of my mind and just go get well. And so I went to South Carolina to stay with my sister to do just that. Yeah. And it was there where I really met my Gethsemane. When you look back on that, um, that tenderness from the Lord, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, so many people say, <laughs> you know, I've never had that experience. But it often happens that way where you get a, a word, and it may be just a word, exile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, boom, the Lord fills in the blanks through those yes. around you. Um, do you think you would have successfully, and what I mean by that is emotionally in a healthy way, come back together if you didn't have that time at your sister's? I have my doubts. I, I really, I'm not sure about that. That could have been the final nail of separation, really, mm -hmm. oh, what absolutely. I'm hearing. Yes. But it was a way to actually begin reconciliation. Yes. Be so, yeah. Because when, when I left, I where I met with, you know, my Gethsemane it was, Lord, if it could be your will, let this cup of divorce pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's a powerful so prayer. So I became Ooh. willing to accept because I knew that he has his own free will and that God would not violate his will. Yeah. He had to come to God by his choice. Ron, okay, so she's now moving to the east with her sister to get some space between you. How's God dealing with your heart? Well, the, God's word says that <clears throat> the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he stole my soul. My mind, my will, and my emotions were depleted. And I had lost everything in every arena of life after 18 months. We sold the business. We sold our home. Uh, my relationship with our children was dwindling. It was spiraling down. Uh, I had lost my my ability to reason, to think. So I got to the point where I realized that I was really out of control of my own life. And I, I had no control over any arena of my life. I was alone. I had bought a, a new fifth wheel travel trailer so I could have some equity out of the marriage. Right? <laughs> Get that fifth wheel. Right. And I wasn't going to pay rent. So I just owned my own little place. And I'm at a campground in, in Branson, Missouri, where we lived. And I got on my knees before God and I said, God, I'm out of control. Hmm. And I knew the only way I could survive was to give God control of my life and mean it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what that really meant at the time. But I said, God, I'm out of control and I need you to take control because I'm, I still need to survive. But in that context, then what were the steps you felt the Lord saying, this is what you do, this is what I'll do, but this is what you got to do. So God had to meet me at the very bottom, at, at the simplest level. Yeah. And he said, go to bed, get some rest for your body. When you awaken in the morning, go back to your office. We'd sold our business, but we hadn't closed on the deal. So we were still running the business. He said, just know this, that whenever the telephone rings, whoever's on the other end of that conversation, I'm in control of your life. Wow. If you go to Walmart, Whatever checkout line you get in, whatever parking space you have, I'm orchestrating your life. I'm in control. I'm calling the shots. I said, God, I can deal with that. Thank you. And it wasn't long after that until Opal came back mm -hmm. to Missouri. She moved in with me, and God started the restoration process in our life. Opal, did you see a change in Ron? Were you... Was it palpable? Was it something you could... I had been praying that God would um, let me know that God was working on Ron. See, I hadn't talked to anybody, no mm. family, nobody. And so when I got back home that day, my sister said, Opal, she said, your father-in-law called today. And I said, really? And she said, yes. She said, and he left you a message. And he said to tell you that all he's hearing from Ron is that he wants his Opal back. Uh. I was like, wow. So that was my first clue that God was indeed doing something. Yeah. So it was just another week or two, maybe, I don't remember. But um, after that, that Ron called me. And he, and he told me about, you know, having this experience. And, and so I could hear some changes. And 
and a little bit of hope. And um, so it just kind of started to grow from there. We started spending some time on the telephone. And and um, my plan was to go back and just gradually try to put this thing back together. But that wasn't what God did. So he, he put it on the fast track. <laughs> he did. <laughs> and how many years ago uh, was that now? I mean, for the skeptic listening, how long has it been? Since 99? Eight, 18 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. so you guys have lived it. You guys are through the mess. Yes. We've got to end with the advice for others. What is the hope? Mm-hmm. What do people that are struggling have to take away from our discussion today to say, okay, if Ron and Opal can do that, we can do this. Well, we made a decision that we wanted to really seek God for what was to take place next in our life. Because here we are, we're living in a fifth wheel, you know, in a, well, yeah, fifth wheel, a new truck. And we were homeless and jobless. Yeah, Yeah. we had no home, we had no business, we had, you know, we were free. So what did he want out of our lives? So we prayed that God would give us divine appointments. Mm -hmm. And boy, did he. And I I, I want to inject this for all the parents and grandparents and siblings and friends that are praying. It was 18 months, but my dad kept coming by my office every day, and he would say, I'll be so glad when God restores your marriage. And I thought, you crazy old man. Ain't going to happen. I'm in control. And you can pray all you want, but it's not going to happen. Well, guess what? It happened. God restored it because his forgiveness is overwhelming, his grace is sufficient, and his mercies are new every day. Ron, every there's, day. There's no better place to end than that. I mean, in, in, in that, everybody's story is going to be different. Um, the core that I want people to hear from your story, though, is that there's hope. There's hope yeah. in Christ. Mm-hmm. And no matter how depleted your marriage appears, if you believe God can work a miracle in your marriage, then there is that hope. And that's what you represent. I so appreciate what you do now with Hope Restored, the Mm -hmm. intensive counseling effort at Focus on the Family there in Branson. If you are a couple who is in that spot where you are struggling, you don't know that you can make it through today, this week, this month, um, this is a program for you. It's brutal. It's Mm -hmm. like you said in the beginning, it's it's spiritual boot camp, it's marriage boot camp. Mm -hmm. Right. And you get down to some very core things. And I'm hearing out of your testimony that God kind of reordered the way you treat each other, the way you communicate with each other, the way you love each other. And most importantly, Ron, in your case, the way you decided it's not about you. That's right. And that's what all of us Christians have to conclude at some point, mm-hmm. that maybe it's about those around us that we need to be um, you know, most attentive to. And I think when we do that, God is pleased. So thank you for being with us. Thank you for your great story in God and what he has done in your lives. Uh, it's been great to, to hear it from you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there. And be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.